Hi, and uh, welcome back to Berlin, to the Nordic Film Music Days. Thanks for joining us for the second seminar of the day in the topic of uh, creating scores, uh, now on the topic of uh, soundtracks, releasing <coughs> them, their importance as a calling card, and, um, and just a general idea of what it takes to release a soundtrack, and if you should or you shouldn't. Um, my name is Jesper Hansen, I'm a film composer, and I also run um, a Danish film music label called Plant Sounds with Halfdan E, you just met in the previous seminar. And um, I think our label has the distinction of being not only the smallest Nordic label devoted to soundtracks, but also the second largest label devoted to soundtracks, because there are only two. And running our esteemed elder brother is uh, Mikael Carlsen joining us from, uh, from Sweden. Mikael, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Hi, Do you hear you. me? I hear you perfectly fine. And thanks for joining us, Mikael. Um, right now, I'm not able to see the slides that I'm using. So maybe the technicians could show me that so I'm not blabbering about. There you are. Can, can you see it, Michael? I cannot see it, but I have them in front of me okay. anyway because you sent them yeah, to me. So, so we're basically at the first slide that says your name. And I was hoping yeah. you could just give a brief introduction. You, you, you founded Movie Score Media in 2005, I know. And just a brief yes. introduction of who you are and and what made you what made you start Movie Score Media back then. Yeah, um, I am actually a former journalist. I started out as a news journalist, but on the side, I was always into music and specifically film music as as a fan and as a journalist too. I was writing a lot of soundtrack reviews. I was interviewing uh, film composers in the '90s quite a lot. And at some point in 2000 and the early first years of, of the millennium, I, I started to feel a certain sort of a fatigue when it came to uh, find, you know, finding really interesting film music to write about. And I discovered that a lot of interesting music is written for independent films, smaller European um, projects maybe. And so I had this idea to launch a label and at the same time, I decided to quit news journalism and started the label on a very small scale in 2006. For the first year, it was only um, it was only uh, digital releases. Uh, that was too much too early for that. Uh, I quickly realized I had to, uh, uh, you know, release CDs, especially for collectors who, who love to to have the. Um, physical product in their shelf and be able to, you know, read through the booklet and all of that. And that's when, where the, the label took off really in terms of the financial side. So from that on, I did CDs through different um, distributors and now uh, I'm back to doing only digital because now that the, 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 you know, the, the, audience uh, is there too in, in a much larger extent than the, the, the audience was in 2006. Um, so today I am um, distributing uh, some of my projects on CD through other labels. I'm working with a label in Spain called Portrait Records. I have uh, you know different collaborations with, with different labels. So that's where I am now, and I'm also should say that I'm also a composer myself. But I'm writing mostly choral music and not film music. I'm writing concert music and stuff like that. So that's a little bit of the background. Thank you very much, and we'll get into the exposure that film music has these days and the interests that has really exploded in the past decade or so. But I think we'll get get right to it, Michael. I just changed the first slide. I mean, that I titled "Should I Release My Score? Why or Why Not?" I mean, these, these days, uh, every single day, around 60,000 new uh, title pieces of music are uploaded to Spotify every single day. Um, so what, what do you do as, as a composer? W which question should you ask yourself if you're considering a release? Um, are there some types of scores that, that work well as a calling card, some that, that don't? And what, what, what is your process when, when selecting scores? Okay, so from my viewpoint there, as as an album producer and uh, a label owner, it's really about the music to begin with. Um, if you're a composer of film music, you're not always going to be in charge of the process and maybe you won't even be in control of whether the, the score will be released as an album or not. 
since the rights are owned and it's a, it's considered to be, or should rightly be considered to be a part of the promotional uh, uh, workflow for a film company. Um, but I think uh, if you're a composer and you want the, the, the type of exposure uh, that, that, that an album can give you, uh, both in terms of that people can discover your music, um, for instance, if they are, you know, just say that the producer or a director is searching through Spotify or anything like that, that, that you can be discovered that way. But also it's, it's a way to get your music noticed and written about by journalists. And you, you can get a, you know, a nice review somewhere online. And that is, is, uh, is a part of, of how you can build your brand, I think, as a composer. And also these days, we, we all know about the, the turmoil surrounding Spotify at the moment. But Spotify has really become an integrated part of, of your calling card as a composer. We all know that ma many music supervisors make playlists on Spotify to find music to share with the director and the composer. Um, but but what, what type of, of, of uh, score would you say that works best and not so well as a release? I mean, <laughs> would, would, would a, a score of, of 57 minutes of, of drone tension music work well as a release? It might it might work perfectly well as a score, but but as a, a as a release, what would you say? Well, you you are you're onto something, obviously. There, if, if the if the music has uh, some kind of uh, let's say, call it a hook, the hook can be a melody, which is not that rare today, as people say. There is actually melodies being written, written for films these days, but you, you hear sometimes. Um, discussions about how melody is is on its way out. But I mean, if you just look for it, you, you will find that there is melody in film music. You have to look in the right places. Uh, the hook can be something that's more um, associated with the si sound design or how, how the, the score sounds, uh, if it's recorded with... Uh, <clears throat> I mean, look at Bernard and Herman, for instance, for, for, for 50 years, 50 years ago, he would com combine instruments in an original way, which made him stand out and still ma makes him stand out. Um, so I think that you, if you have something in, in your score that's uh, sort of unique, um, you, you shouldn't be afraid to, to uh, you know, approach labels or decide to, to re release the score yourself. And, and, and on that topic, we'll just go to the next slide, uh, how to prepare your score for release. Uh, when, when you receive a score from a composer, maybe someone you worked with before or a potential new new composer, uh, mm. what, what's your advice on preparing the release? The, the, would, would you, I mean, also if you just look briefly at, at, at the next uh, slide, I've sort of, that there's, there's an argument going on. We, we did a, a sort of an archive release some years ago and when we announced the release, I had two emails on the same day. One saying, please release it all, no edits, just as it is in the film, every single second. And the second email I said, please don't release everything. Please you know, do suites and, and, and add the cues to, together to make them longer. What, what would your advice be and what's your philosophy on Movies Go Media? My philosophy is definitely not to uh, be uh, of, you know, a historical archive of uh, unedited cues, one after another, presented in a more or less chronological playlist format. I believe in the, as I'm also working in concerts and doing concert arrangements of film music and putting together programs of film music, I think it's very, very important to um, understand that uh, film music, you know, it's, it can take on a, a life on its own uh, without the images, but usually it requires a little bit of work, work when it comes to editing, uh, sequencing, even mastering, of course, and remixing if you want to do that. Um, and I think as a composer, if you want to approach a label um, to to um, to get your score out, you shouldn't be too worried about um, doing that work prior to presenting the score. I think that what you, you should do is to uh, maybe pick out the five or six cues that you feel are the most original or the one that has the best sound or some kind of standout qualities being representative of, of the score as a whole and just send that to uh, a label that you want to work with. And I think that you can 
I think that you can, uh, you know, is sending the full thing is you don't have to do that because most la label producers, they, they have a lot of music to, to listen to anyway. Um, so just single out what you think is the most interesting thing. And then, of course, a label can't thrive without some kind of commercial um, uh, reality. And we need to know more about the film, uh, where it's going to be uh, distributed, where you're going to be able to um, get some buzz going around the, the music for the film, because there is nothing in the world that is a better uh, PR um, instrument for, for, for a film score album than the film itself, obviously. So, um, which is what, why we, for instance, see so many television scores being released now. Uh, it has been a trend in the past two, three years when we saw the Mandalorian scores being released, an album for each episode, which is, which is unheard of 10 years ago. You would get a CD maybe with music from, from a full season, but now they are releasing um, uh, one album per episode. And I think that's because in television, you get a lot of exposure. If you have the, the, the show on a streaming um, uh, platform like Netflix or something similar, there is going to be a lot of people watching. So that's very interesting, of course, for a label. To, to do that. But if, if we're looking at this, that's one part of it. As a composer, if it's a small independent project uh, that's going to be shown in a documentary festival on, on you know, in anywhere in Europe, maybe only, uh, you know, maybe only a couple of hundred people are going to actually see the film in the theater. You never know where it's going to head. And I think that's when you have to regard the album much more as a promotional tool for you as a composer, because there is no, there's not going to be much business uh, in doing an album. So uh, a guy like me, I like to to uh, see if there is a little bit business in it, but I also have a passion for great composers, new music and all of that. So I think that if you want to release music that might not be from uh, the biggest Netflix show at the moment, you have to find a label that has that kind of energy going as well. And, and Michael, what about the, 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 the tedious process and, and sometimes really difficult process of naming cues? Because there, there was a release uh, of, of, the, of the movie Science many years ago by, by, by music by James Newton Howard. And it was released before the, music, the film was, was released. And the, the, the final cue, or was it almost final cue, was called Malcolm is Dead. So it basically spoiled the entire film before the film was released. Yes. Um, what, 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 do you, what do you say to, to naming titles? Is it important? Does, does it help the release to have? Uh, yeah, I think it does. Um, there's one, I mean, if you look at it from the, just from the composer's perspective, what you, what you say is uh, something that I really have to uh, uh, bring up on almost every release, that there is a cue title which doesn't take into consideration that it might be containing a spoiler, as you mentioned. So usually we uh, rename uh, tracks uh, as, a, as a secret code word. Everyone uh, knows that uh, if we have Jesper's, um, uh, <laughs> um, what do you call it? Um, Jesper's destiny, then you know that Jesper is dying at the end of the film. <laughs> But it's usually the code where you can say in the track title that the main protagonist is going to die at the end of the film, of course. But renaming it is, is good. But for a composer, it might be interesting to, to give it a thought as well, how you can name a title on a track that you are particularly proud of. For instance, if you want to have a, a filmmaker discovering your track just through browsing uh, um, Spotify or any other platform, you might, and that, that, that person is looking for a chase cue. That person is going to type in chase, you know, maybe even more specifically, chase in the forest or whatever. And if, if, if you've done a cue like that, that, maybe that will be discovered that way. So um, I think it's wise to be a little, um, instrumental in how you you title the track see i i don't think that it you know affects sales 
um, for the album as um, per se, but it might be uh, a good tool for you as a composer to actually get people to hear the music. So you can think of the title as a tag almost that people will, will almost like yeah, that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Regarding the question of, of how much to include, I mean, we, we've done this a few times that for the completists that we have a link online. So we have the score release and for people who want the, the odd three seconds of, a, of, a, of something that's not included, they can download it on a link. Uh, and that goes especially for, for sort of older releases for archive material. Moving on to the, to the next slide, Michael. Um, I brought a few of, of our CD releases and uh, actually this year uh, the CD is, is 40 years old. Um, how important oh. is physical media, CDs, and the resurgence of, 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 of vinyl in, in 2022? I mean, I know a lot of composers, not necessarily film composers, but many composers, they like to have something to hold when they have... A, I've made an album, it's important for them to have something physical to sort of to show by it, but, but how important is it uh, as, as a calling card? And, and does, it, does it give more leverage to release, to have it in, on a physical uh, product? I think that um, that is a twofold um, question again, because um, as a, as a, as a composer, of course, it's going to be something to uh, you know if you can show them the actual album as a physical product, that's going to make some kind of impression, hopefully a positive one. Um, but on the other hand. Uh, I can't say that I uh, have seen a lot of, um, you know, that it would affect the, the commercial uh, side of, of, um, of the label. Um, collectors is one thing, um, because you have, you have collectors who want to have the CD, but we have to remember and be realistic about the fact that even if the, the uh, soundtracks in, in general is a growing, almost exploding kind of genre, if you can call it that. The, the type of listeners that are going to require first, just to go back to your previous um, topic as well, uh, you, you won't get the, um, that, that there are not that many people who really, you know, requires a, a complete score release to begin with. Um, it's much more common to want to experience, a, you know, a good programming, a, a, a good piece of music, and it doesn't have to be every note job. It. Um, I, for instance, I happen to all, almost always prefer the original 1970s or 80s John Williams edits that came out on, out on an LP, and now we have these you know, two hour uh, complete score releases. And it's just, for me, it's too much. Uh, it, you know, the music really uh, is, of course, in the case of John Williams, it's, it's you know, always interesting and great in, in every way you can imagine. But I think that you don't be too, as a composer yourself, I think that you should not be too uh, pretentious when it comes to, to that you want every note of your score out because it, I, I'm pretty sure that it's not going. If you're not John Williams, that's not going to to work in favor of of the music as a whole. I don't think so. But uh, going back to the CD question, that's also related to to, to uh, collectors. Some collectors want it. No one really collects albums digitally. Uh, of course, uh, it, it's it's a different you know it's a different scenario. Uh, so if, I mean, if you want to have, um, if you really want to have like a gift to people, be it filmmakers that you want to uh, promote yourself um, to, or you you uh, you have a certain fan base, you can press. Uh, uh, but you know that there's a, a very common figure today. I don't know just how uh, how big numbers you did of your Olsen Banden. Uh, stuff for instance but you know uh, let's say it's 300 copies is a very common number now that's 300 300 copies and you won't even sell them but when when we started uh, the, the the lowest number we could press was 500 now it's 200 and we did uh, we did uh, pinscliff uh, 
uh, which sold really well. And I was always spending. We did a three CD box that that sold out a thousand units, sold out fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, but, but there you. But the rest, yeah, is is difficult to sell more than twenty or fifty copies of some some of them. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's because you have uh, in those cases you have such a uh, a big fan base from the beginning of the actual film or, or and the music, of course. So there might not be uh, only. Uh, Hinchliff uh, fans, uh, music fans who will buy that is going to be fans of the action, you know, the whole thing, fans of the memory of it, even. So, yeah, so exactly. um, that's that's different. That's different. But if you you just wrote a new score for for a you know some kind of independent thriller or something like that, you know, you have to really balance things in how you you present yourself. I think. Yeah, I agree. Moving on, Michael, to, to the next one. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, it, uh, around 60,000 new pieces of music are released every single day on Spotify. When you release your score, either th yourself or, or, or through your label or mine or, or whichever label, what, what, what can you expect? Um, what is uh, sort of the, is there an average number of, of, of listeners for, for a new release? Um, I mean, what, what, what can you expect as, as a composer of, of film music these days for your, your product to do? It, it really, really depends on the, the film or the series or the game itself. If it's a, if it's going to have a, you know a broad audience uh, all over the world, you're going to see some traffic. If it's only a local thing that's just you know like a documentary that's uh, it was produced in Switzerland and, and shown at a film festival there, you won't see any numbers because we can only um, a, as a label we can only try to uh, promote the music. Uh, at the fa fan base level and where you can connect on social media and you can do everything you can to to let people know that this music is so beautiful you have to give it a shot you never heard of the film i know that but you have to give it a shot because the music is so great that's that's the trickiest part of running a, a small independent label like mine where i've released albums um, that are so beautiful, they would, you know, they would deserve all the praise that you can imagine. But no one heard of the film. I've even put out music from films that basically never came out at all. But the music is so good. But of course, it's incredibly difficult to market that. And I don't think that you as a composer on such projects can, you know, you shouldn't expect any, any big revenues coming from it. But it is an incredibly good tool for you, I think, because it can generate some good writing about your music. Uh, some reviewer might discover your music and will follow you uh, going forward. And I mean, uh, for instance, uh, I know that last year, I think Pessi Levanto was, uh, well, well, he had a nomination at the Harpa. And um, I've been releasing all of his music and the, the first album we released were a couple of years ago. And then people start to follow the only if, if it's only a few in such a small, um, you know, uh, such a small world as film music is. Some writers are quite influential. And if they write something good, that's going to uh, be presented on the Internet. It's going to sit there. And you as a composer can use some quotes from that. Um, and these writers are actually quite knowledgeable when it comes to film music. So that's a good tool for you. And you can also build your own playlists. I mean, like you use Wheelcraft or anything like that. You can also build a playlist on, on um, if you want to pitch yourself for a project, you can build a, a, a playlist with your music from your actual albums. And it's going to be a little bit impressive that these are actually projects that, that someone thought were worth releasing. So that brings it to, to a little different level, I think. And that leads us into the next one, actually, the, the next slide. Um, because there, there are things you can do. And basically, for every streaming platform, there is an artist app you can get. I mean, Spotify for artists, uh, Amazon Music for artists, Apple Music for artists, Tidal Music for artists, and so on. And it, it does actually matter. If, if, if you go into those and you have a profile with an updated bio, a photo of yourself, so you show them that you're actually interested in being uh, featured in that platform because you can pitch music. I know Amazon Music, you can pitch uh, a song up, up to two, two weeks after its release. And 
it's sort of it's obvious if they can tell that you're interested in being on that platform, um, then they're more likely to put your, your music featured on a playlist on that platform. So that's one of the things you can do to achieve more, more visibility. Uh, do you have other other tips uh, in that regard, Mikael? I, th I think being active is really uh, key because if you if you release an album and just doesn't do anything with it, you're not interested in where it's going. If anyone is listening to it, it's not going to uh, impress anyone, even if the music is good. So I think that if you're a composer who who uh, you, you should really take part in the um, in the marketing of the album because you, as a composer, might have different uh, connections online on social media. You will have uh, um, the label will have the fan base for film music, but you will have the fan base for the film maybe, or people who worked on, on the film. You know, people you you. Uh, uh, been uh, acquainted to through the, throughout your whole career, maybe, will be connected to you, so that will, there will be ripples on the water. Um, and I think that being active on social media, maybe you can, if you record a score with a small stream group, for, for instance, why, why not just put up a camera there? You can just do a, you can just do a simple, you know, iPhone recording. Uh, not in terms of the sound, it's going to sound crappy, but the image is going to be perfectly fine and you can then try to edit that together to a little, you know, one minute behind the scenes thing about the, the music for this film and take your, take your music seriously and it doesn't end with, with the first film release. Another thing I want to say is that I, I, I think it's very good for independent films to have um, an album out quite early on and not wait until the film gets a release on, you know, finally Netflix will pick it up uh, a year after or, you know, or something like that. Just put it out there as early as possible because you're going to have so many different, hopefully, if the, the film goes from festival to festival to festival, you're going to be able to have so many marketing opportunities for the album instead of it, you know, falling flat on the floor. Um, after too late so if it's different if it's a big project i mean but you see even the new batman film that michael giacchino is doing the score we had has already recorded the score for we see a single out now and a second single just came out so everyone knows that you have to you can't be too late with it you can't just wait there and sit and you have to be active and that goes for both labels and of course, the composers. Be proud of your work. If you decided to put it out there, this is also, uh, <laughs> I'm blabbering now, but this is also quite important, I think. Uh, if you decide to put out your music there, if you are, are in control of the rights, be proud of it. And you know, don't make any, excuse, any excuses. If, if you decide to put it out on an album, it should be able to stand on its own uh, two feet and you know, be music. Um, so, you know, because it's, it's not uncommon that a, a composer would say, yeah, but you really don't, don't understand this music because you should really experience it in the film. Yes, of course. But if that's the case, the only way it works, don't put it out. Yeah, exactly. Well, time flies when you're having fun. And uh, one minute left, it says here on my iPad. So I think we'll better <laughs> wrap it up. Um, there are no questions on my iPad, which... I guess since we only have one minute left, is uh, is a good thing. Um, and uh, so, Michael, just want to thank you for joining us. I mean, you and I could talk about this for hours because we we love what we're doing. And yeah. I know you are you are very instrumental in making uh, really awesome playlists on Spotify. So do please check uh, uh, Mika's profile on uh, on Spotify. There are some great playlists there. And uh, thanks for joining us to all of you who's been watching. And there's another seminar coming up shortly. And uh, yeah, don't hesitate to call either, write either Michael or myself if you have questions about labels and releases of soundtracks. So thank you for now. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.